All right, my English teacher friends, I have an exciting writing workshop for you today. It's going to spotlight FRQ2 from the 2022 exam, which showcased an excerpt from Linda Hogan's People the Whale, our old octopus friend. And today I want to show you what I call the button trick. And I think this is the best way to teach a line of reasoning. So my template of the syllogistic method is a really good way to stay very cogent within the body paragraphs. But as we know, it all starts with the introduction. So in this particular writing workshop, we're going to take a look at four introductions that use my inverted triangulated methods called the inverted thesis. And then we're going to tackle body paragraphs syllogistically. And the goal is to see how to stay really, really locked in in terms of our logical progression from start to finish to get that elusive sophistication point. So I'll talk about all things voice, rhythm, flow, you know, how to write with the flair and the spunkiness that is needed to get the sophistication point. But one of the main things, clearly, if you're going to get the sophistication point, is that you have to be really, really cogent in your thinking from top to bottom. So I have a strategy called the button trick that will nicely elucidate that process for us. So one of the things that I always point out in my writing workshop videos is this. There's a seismic difference between the assigning of writing and the direct explicit teaching of it. And one of the questions that I'm always bantering around is this. What if we taught composition like Bob Ross teaches painting? This is a question that I posed to Ted Sizer back when I was in graduate school, and he thought I was ludicrous for it, but it's kind of become the, uh, the mantra of my teaching over my 20 plus year career. Because here's what happens when we ask this question and provide an answer to it. The teacher positions themselves as the expert writer in the classroom and gets right up to the canvas and easel with their students and paints with them. And here's the kicker about Bob Ross. He used a heuristic, We in composition we call it a template, in painting, you call it a heuristic, known as the wet on wet technique. So every time he did a na natural landscape, a nature landscape, he busted out the wet on wet technique and systematically uniformly used that with pretty much everything that he produced on the joy of painting. And the same can be held true for my students. They know that they're going to either declare or invert the thesis in the introductory paragraph, no matter the expository mode. So clearly we're going to be doing literary analysis for this, but it works for rhetorical analysis, argument, persuasion, synthesis, and even research, the declarative and the inverted. And then always, 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 again, no matter the expository mode, uh, my students can go syllogistically throughout their body paragraph to stay very organized and uh, to make sure that that line of reasoning stays intact. So here's the prompt just to refamiliarize ourselves with this. And again, it comes from the 2022 exam. So the following excerpt is from Linda Hogan's novel, People of the Whale, published in 2008. In this passage, the narrator describes two events that occur in a community, an infant's birth shortly followed by an octopus's walking out of the sea. Read the passage carefully. Then in a well-written essay, analyze how the author uses literary elements and techniques to develop a complex characterization of the community. So this one was really odd and a little tricky. I remember my students came back and they're like, what the heck was this? And, you know, for a few of my students, it went right over their heads. They weren't uh, quite uh, ready to read this type of work. And uh, several of my students crushed it, though. So here's the first question out of the gate. So how do I write the introductory paragraph? And as I've already alluded to, we can declare or invert. But here's the kicker, for, especially for those that are familiar with my work. You know for literary analysis, my students almost uniformly invert the thesis. It's actually an easier way to approach it. For rhetorical analysis, my students declare. And then for argument, persuasion, synthesis, and research, it's really a 50-50 coin flip contingent upon the prompt and the rhetorical strategy or angle that the student wants to take. So for literary analysis, we are going to invert, but I'll unpack both of them for us just for clarity's sake. 
So implicit in every FRQ1 and FRQ2 for the AP literature exam dating all the way back to the exam's infancy, there are two implicit questions in that prompt that we just looked at. The first is, what is the authorial intent? And the second is, how does the author construct meaning? This is why we're going to invert. When you answer the question, how does the author construct meaning, you're dropping your terms, devices, techniques. Therefore, this is going to be the thesis statement. So what my students do is this. They take three sentences to provide the context and background of the authorial intent, kind of the exigence of the piece or the universal truth, the universal theme, so what is the authorial intent is three sentences and then they culminate it with this how does the author construct meaning in one sentence so all of my introduction templates are four sentences long so let's take a look at that real quick so this is the declarative where you begin with the thesis and we don't want to drop the terms and devices uh, right out of the gate because you need some context and background before you do that so we're going to skip by this one and go right to inverted. So three sentences, authorial intent, one sentence, how does the author construct meaning? So you end with the thesis. So of course, you got to provide a little bit of context and background for this without being overly plot summative. We don't want it to read like a cliff note summation, uh, all focused on thesis. Now, tier two and sentence constructs are a little tricky. And I'll just give a cursory overview of what I mean by this. My students, you know, beginning with on level ninth graders all the way through my university students, go through my Word Study Academy and my Nuance Academy. And these are two things that I go over in great detail in all of my National Writing Project courses. Tier 2 simply means Tier 2 level vocabulary, and it's your average run-of-the-mill SAT level caliber word. So I know in 21 years of teaching that there's a vocabulary void, and it's growing, you know, it, you know this big chasm every year. Kids come to me more devoid of the words that I, I wish they knew. So I have a responsibility to address that. So the Word Study Academy is this very intensive vocabulary series of exercises that we do to help address that gap. So you're going to see my students wield some pretty fancy verbiage here that, um, you know, they've been, they've been trained to do. So at the time of recording this video, it's the middle of January. I've had them since Labor Day. So they've really gone through an extensive gamut of word study. Sentence constructs it hits upon this. Uh, according to Strunk and White in their seminal text called Write It Right, they make the assertion in what is known as rule number 18 that there's 12 different ways to cobble together a single sentence. Here's the kicker. Most students who are struggling or emerging writers manipulate three sentence constructs. So short, simple declaratives, independent clauses, and sometimes we might get an adverb or an adjective clause thrown in there for good effect. So you're not going to get any sophistication points, only wielding three of the 12. So you're going to see my students manipulate their syntax in the hopes of achieving better voice rhythm and flow, which are essential to sophistication, you know, to have some flair and some pizzazz in the writing. So the tier two, you know, we don't want to totally geek out. I, I, I want my students to stay in their wheelhouse and not sound overly contrived or pedantic. So they do throw in a little bit of colloquial and vernacular just to teeter-totter balance it all out. They are, after all, you know, 17-year-olds, you know, writing, and you know, for a timed exam. So I don't want it to be overly, you know, PhD in terms of its tone. So a little bit of colloquial and vernacular goes a long way in terms of getting that sophistication going. And then, as I already said, four sentences long. So let's take a look at four of these. All right. First three sentence are going to be authorial intent. Last sentence is going to be construction of meaning. It's always three plus one. Note the vocab and note the sentence constructs as well. It is human tendency for the mind to impose causal order to that which cannot be explained, right? And that's kind of the whole exigence of the piece, right? You get to the aha, the gist of what Hogan is doing. 
Given this, as can be seen historically in origin stories, mankind ascribes value and meaning to that which is inexplicable. Whether it be explaining the essence of life, the cause of the universe, or even the how and the why of octopus behavior, man can invent some far-fetched stories. All right, so we're three sentences into this, and you can see that's all into, you know, the authorial intent, the universal truth, the exigence, the theme, context, background without retelling the story. Fourth sentence, I tell my students, don't give me a literary terms dumping ground. Focus on the most germane and salient terms in the piece, the ones that really are essential to the construction of meaning. So look what student number one does. Linda Hogan allegorically comments upon this phenomena through her representation of the community and its collective interpretation of their cave dwelling resident. So it definitely is anchored in the prompt, but this idea that we're dealing with an allegory is really significant. And that's probably the most essential literary feature of the piece is that it's allegorical and it's rendering. So my students, uh, you know, you know, hopefully picked up on that. We did a number of uh, allegorical studies over the course of our months together prior to the exam. So a couple of my students missed it, but most of them were, were able to get that. So you end with construction of meaning, three sentences, authorial intent atop. All right, let's take a look at student number two. Ever since the advent of time, man has sought to give voice to the ineffable qualities of nature. And again, the aha, the exigence, the gist, the theme, the main idea, the universal truth. Man is a meaning maker, and when meaning cannot be made, he creates stories and ascribes value to things that are actually meaningless and rather innocuous. This is why history is dotted with false gods and false prophets. So we're at the fourth sentence. Let's do the same thing as student one. Hit me with the terms and devices. Linda Hogan touches upon this fact through her allegorical rendering of the octopus and her characterization of human reasoning. All right, so we got allegory, characterization. And even though this is a work of fiction, my students, I, I had them in AP Lang. Uh, you know, they, they followed me from 10 honors to AP Lang to AP Lit. So a lot of my students actually talked about the syllogistic construct in the story itself. It's very logos heavy. It's very logic driven. So in terms of human reasoning, they're touching upon the logos of it. Now, in both example one and example two, you have some really nice tier two, advent, ineffable, uh, are in there, ascribe, innocuous, rendering, right? So some good, good verbiage in there, but it's not over the top, right? The kid stays in his wheelhouse and is doing pretty fine. In terms of sentence constructs, I really like this second sentence, you know, with the double the double dash in it is pretty nice. And then there's just good variety in terms of other sentences. So one of the things I tell my students is this, especially in the introduction, you really gotta be mindful not to parallel your syntax. I think that that creates a droning rhythm, kind of like a da dot da dot da dot da dot And, uh, you know, kind of that, like that railroad track rhythm. And that's going to preclude students from getting the sophistication point. Everything needs to be varied. And, you know, even though we study parallelism and anaphora and all that kind of stuff, students in composition probably don't want to be doing that unless they have a real good reason to. You know, if a student can articulate to me why they're doing it and it makes sense, I'm like, yeah, open the gates, go for it. But typically it's just the sign of, you know, a struggling emerging writer um, not being able to manipulate sentence complexity. So here's example number three, exact same approach in the template. Three plus one, authorial intent, construction of meaning. Life, sadly, is meaningless. Whoa, very well said. That's very powerful. Ever since we pulled ourselves upright and began to do this thing called living, mankind has sought to make sense of his world and its origins. As such, over this great expanse of time, there have been countless gods, deities, and prophets, all of whom are meaningless. 
All right. It should say Linda Hogan. It says Logan Hogan. But Linda Hogan gives voice to this through her allegorical depiction of the octopus and through the characterization of the community that interact with it. So again, last sentence, terms, devices, techniques. Got to have a literary focus because we're performing literary analysis and not plot analysis. So this is how we do the intros. Three plus one, focus on those sentence constructs. Focus on the tier two without overdoing it. Last one, three plus one. Man's most preeminent fear is that life is for naught. For centuries, great philosophical minds have wrangled with the big questions as to why we are here and who made us and what does it all add up to. Thousands of years after, we still do not have any definitive answers, yet we persist in trying to make sense of our world. Note, my students are using the plural we sometimes. I'm totally okay with that. And I know some composition teachers are like, no, you can't do that. You know, it has to be one. You have to say one, third person. But I'm actually okay with the we. And I've seen uh, in my study of college board sample papers, kids getting the sophistication point by going second person. And even sometimes a little bit of first person bodes well. I think it's a smoother voice when students do this. And I know that some teachers are like, Christian, you're nuts. You're bananas for saying that. But as long as the student doesn't overdo it and over rely on it, I think it's a fine twist every now and then. So we're three sentences in. That's authorial intent. Last sentence, construction of meaning. Linda Hogan unpacks this human condition through her allegorical depiction of the octopus and the community's collective rationalizing of its behavior and existence. So again, note the tier two. Also note the sentence constructs. It has great voice rhythm and flow. And I think with all four examples, if an, you know, an AP reader were to stop at the end of the introduction, I think all of them would scratch their chins and say, oh, yes, yes, indeed. If this student can continue to carry this degree of writing and control, I'm going to give this kid the sophistication point at the end of this, right? So out of the gate, all four of these students are blazing. They're on fire. And they've positioned themselves to get the sophistication point all day long. So that's boding well for them. So now the trick is this. How do you keep it all organized? How do you organize the body paragraphs and the pith, the substance of the analysis? So that's our question. How do I write the body paragraphs? And my tacit response to that always is, proceed syllogistically. I know that some of you are new to my work and some of you have been on my bandwagon for a while now. So I'm just going to give a cursory overview of the syllogistic method enough so that you'll have a working knowledge of what I'm doing in the remaining slides in the, in, in the remainder of the writing workshop. And then hopefully you can equip your students with the template as well. If you want to do a deep dive into how I teach inductive and deductive reasoning and kind of the history of the syllogistic method, just hop into the YouTube channel. There's a ton of stuff in there that, uh, that goes over this more thoroughly. But in brief, the syllogistic method is rooted in the Aristotelian tradition. It comes from Aristotle. He ran a school called the Lyceum, and the rich kids from town would go there, and they would learn about polemics, oration, debate, wordsmithing, word wrangling. And they would also often tussle with uh, these really big questions like, what is justice? And some of you might be familiar with this tradition and this body of work. The text Plato's Republic deals with that question. So the great philosophical think tankers and orators would step to the proverbial mic and they would drop their definition of what justice is. And Aristotle, just like us composition teachers, you know, said, wow, I have some really good orators. Some of these, some of these students can really debate well. They argue just flawlessly. Some are men. Some of them just can't put it together. They can't, they can't pull the strings of the argument. Why is that? And one day he had a eureka moment and he said, aha, I got it. The students that package their arguments syllogistically do the best in debates. They end up having the most cogent, rational thought processes. And all a syllogism is, is basically logos. It's premise, premise, conclusion. So if I were to say in the first premise, arsenic is deadly. 
Second premise, my dog ate arsenic. You would naturally conclude my dog is going to die. And even though that's a bleak example, this is the type of cogency that we want our students to adhere to in their writing. Boom, 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 you know, but often, especially when we read FRQ1s and FRQ2s, the sample papers that the college board puts out, oftentimes students only present the second premise and it leaves us scratching our heads saying, hmm, why is this so plot heavy? Why does this read like a cliff note summation? It's because they're ceasing to argue. And here's the kicker, all right? And I'll show you the next slide here. In order for students to perform literary analysis from top to bottom in their paper, they have to argue. We have to remind students that expository writing is an act of argumentation. So in the first premise of my template, students have to argue, make an argument anchored in the terms, devices, techniques. So make some literary argument. I'm going to model this for you in just a second, but this is three sentences long. On FRQ1, on the AP language exam, the College Board states three times, your argument must be central. To keep the centrality of the argument in literary analysis, and this is true of, of whenever students are writing syllogistically, to keep the centrality of the argument, I have them write it out and extend it over three sentences. That way, the reader has no doubt whatsoever that the student is gauged in pure, 100% pure literary analysis, zero plot synopsis at all. So you got to argue with your terms devices. Second premise, we have the text in front of us. So we're going to offer textual support in the form of quoting and paraphrasing. We're going to teeter-totter balance that out. You don't want to do one more at the expense of the other. So support is second premise. The conclusion of the body paragraph, and I really want to enunciate this clearly because I get a lot of questions on this. Body paragraphs have conclusions. You just can't draw, you know, end on a quote. You can't walk away from your reasoning. You know, an argument has a conclusion. So we're going to echo, link, promise back to the prompt and the thesis statement. Now, in terms of moves, this takes about 10 to 12 sentences. I always tell my students, shoot for 10 sentences per body paragraph. Try not to go over 12. So here's the other thing that teachers ask me a lot. How many paragraphs do my students do on the exam? So for all FRQs, whether it's Lang or Lit, my students do four paragraphs and uh, intro, two bodies, and a conclusion. So as advertised, I want to show you the button trick. One of the things that I tell my students all the time is this. The first premise is a promise. And if you are going to sustain a cogent line of reasoning, you have to keep your promises. I am going to break my line of reasoning deliberately in this piece to show you what happens when promises aren't kept. So I remember as a little kid playing button, button, who's got the button with my grandparents. I was the youngest of seven children, and we used to play this with my grandparents all the time. And for whatever the reason, I was thinking of how to teach line of reasoning. And I don't know, my, my, my grandmother's voice like echoed in my ear. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's just like button, button, who's got the button. So what I'm going to do is drop a different color button next to each term that I'm going to argue. So red has a term technique device. Yellow is going to be syntax. I'm focusing on pronouns and sentence constructs. So it just double whammy that. And then the green is going to be the reasoning, the logic of the piece. So I do have stems for my template, and you'll notice that most of my students will start their first uh, body paragraph with something like this right from the onset. It cues the reader into knowing that you have a supreme logical sequence, that you're going to be very chronologically ordered and organized. So students often ask, where do I begin? And I say, start right where Hogan starts, and then just methodically work your way through. So a nice little transition like, 
right from the onset bodes well. So my students often say this exactly or something closely akin to it to give a chronological progression. So then we're just going to cherry pick the terms, devices, techniques in the order that Hogan uh, employs. And we'll, uh, we'll proceed through, the, uh, through our two body paragraphs that way. So let's take a look here. Three sentences. Right from the onset, Hogan creates a ca 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 causal, I can't speak, a causal relationship between the birth of the infant and the inexplicable behavior of the octopus. So red is going to be, you know, representative of this juxtaposition, this relationship between the infant and the octopus. In many ways, because of the manner in which the pronouns and conjunctions are manipulated, the passage unfolds like a syllogistic argument progressing from if statements to then claims. So the logos is going to be represented by the green button. Pronouns and conjunctions are going to be represented by the yellow. The short, simple declarative sentences also highlight this quality. So I'm just tying syntax with yellow. So there's a couple of syntactical features. Now here's the thing. We've just made a promise. Button, button, who's got the button? In our second premise, we want red quotes and or paraphrases, yellow quotes and or paraphrases, and green quotes and or paraphrases. So the fourth sentence begins the second premise. Look where we go. So immediately get into the text. Within the first two paragraphs, Hogan references it on several occasions and qualifies the meaning being ascribed to the octopus by the humans with as if statements. So I've already got a little bit of red and a little bit of green down, right? I'm going to be talking about the syllogism and uh, the logos, the reasoning behind it and also the juxtaposition. So those are perfect quotes, right? That's one of the things for line of reasoning. The quotes need to be germane to the promise of the first premise. So uh, the syllogistic method, I think, really nice, nicely helps students uh, quote select, because sometimes that feels very arbitrary. So if we quote, we got to analyze. For example, we are told that every one of these ocean people stood back, amazed to see it walk, the eye of it looking at them, each one seen as if each one were known in all their past, all their future. All right, so let's really hammer this out. The it is the divine significance of the octopus, as well as the human tendency to deify nature when nature's chaos renders things ineffable. And you're still doing the same things here, right, with the vocab and the sentence structures as we were doing in the uh, introductions. It's essential for voice, rhythm, flow, sophistication, spunk, flair, all those things, the personality of the student. We have to focus on all of those things. Now, one of the things that I want to mention here is this. There's a template within the template. I call it the five word rule. So up until this point, you may have noticed that the quote transitions are silky smooth. This student is using something called the five word rule. And it works like this. If a student places a minimum of five words in front of the quote and keeps the quote relatively small, it should sound conversational. And then the caveat to that is bracket as needed. So you really need to model for your students how to bracket. So I, I think there are a few brackets in here along the way. So observe how my students are doing that. So keep going here. We got the green and the red going. In this regard, the it is analogous to what humans have done for centuries in terms of divining their known through the likes of gods, prophets, and deities. The fact of the matter is that man does not know his origin, so he indulges in as if thinking because he's afraid of its potent meaning. So I like what this student is doing. Just drop the quotes in there. <coughs> drop the quotes in in order to analyze and support, right? Textual analysis, textual support. Instead of just quote dumping, which oftentimes our students do, we're, again, we're performing analysis. This all needs to be analytical. So we have to quote select with purpose. And it's that one, two jab of quote, analyze, quote, analyze, paraphrase, analyze. So let's keep going here. 
Given that much of life is inexplicable to the human mind, Hogan notes that mankind arbitrarily conflates cause and effect and does things like think it was a holy creature in its presence at the time of his birth granted to Thomas a special life. Kind of an abrupt quote transition there, but it's okay. That's one little snafu with this student's sample here. Further, mankind becomes convinced of these concocted associations. All right. So the button trick. Let's go back to our first premise. Where's our yellow in that second premise? We never talked about pronouns, conjunctions, or the short, simple declarative sentences. Here's something I see students do a lot of, uh, especially when they're using my templates or when they're trying to stay cogent and logical and keep the line of reasoning intact. You get to the conclusion of the syllogism and it's kind of like, oh crap, I got to throw that in there. I forgot all about it. So look what happens here. Typically, you're not analyzing in the conclusion. It's just a wraparound. You go back to the prompt. You go back to the thesis. It's like a two-sentence move. But look what this student does. As existential as it may sound, the causal relationships in the passage and the syntactical arrangements make one thing clear. Most of the meaning humans ascribe to higher powers is meaningless and arbitrary. As Freud said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. So, all right, let's go back here. You promised a discussion of pronouns, conjunctions, and short, simple declarative sentences. It's not in here. It's not in here. So the line of reasoning gets broken. One of the things that students do with my template sometimes is they overload this first premise. They put too many things in here. So there's a couple of fixes to this. Again, because you don't want this ungodly long body paragraph that's you know eclipsing 17, 18, 19 sentences. That's just too unwieldy. So there's a couple of things I would do to ask the students to, to revise this. They can get the syntactical yellow out of here, or what they can do is focus, uh, get rid of a couple of sentences on the it, because this is it, it, the it and the as if, because that's really thoroughly done. And there's probably a couple of sentences that I would call fat on the bone. They could just trim it out and get the yellow in here. Get a quick discussion of those conjunctions and short, simple declarative sentences and put that in here so that everything stays cogent. Again, you don't need to belabor the syntax, but you could link the syntax to the logos and the juxtaposition, and it would be stellar analysis. So that's kind of the button trick. What you promise, you have to deliver. Button, button, where is the button? Who's got the button? All right, very clever trick to make sure that students are staying very cogent in their piece. So I'm going to wrap this up and just say that if you like what you're seeing and want to work together, I offer a slew of professional development opportunities through the National Writing Project. Some are free and some you got to pay for. So on a monthly basis, we have a cadence where I offer one free webinar uh, per month. So I keep my Facebook group appraised of those events as well as the other Facebook groups. And then I do offer some paid programs like my Teach It Right Five Week Mastermind. So in this mastermind, we thoroughly go over deep, deep dive into my Word Study Academy, my Nuance Academy, all things strunk in white. Uh, that's kind of a staple text in my class. And uh, we go over my 40 alternatives to traditional grading so that you get your weekends and your evenings back. And what we're going to do in the next run is beginning January 29th, 2023, we are going to meet for five consecutive Sundays. We begin at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, go for one hour, followed by Q&A. And each week we tackle one aspect of the, uh, of the template or the alternative grading methods and run through those academies and then a uh, thorough deep dive into, into the templates across the expository modes as well. So that is being offered. And then some people just don't have five weekends free, five Sunday nights free. So we do have a self-paced course as well. And then um, I do these little one-offs as well. 
uh, stagger them throughout the school year where we do a two-hour intensive on my alternative grading methods and offer those nuance academies and word study academies as well. Just do little one knockoffs because I know some teachers don't feel they need a, uh, a five-week PD course. So all of the PD courses, even though they're five hours, uh, National Writing Project awards a 10-hour completion badge, which is great for those teachers needing PD hours. So you give up five hours, you get 10, a badge of 10. So double your time. If you want more information on any of these things, feel free to drop me a line at teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. All the information about National Writing Project, I have a shop uh, as well on my webpage so that you can get some slides. There's some free content on there as well. You can visit uh, my website at teachinghowtowrite.com or shoot me an email, teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. So hope all is well. Happy teaching and happy writing.